I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All your works praise you, Lord. You're faithful. Your people extol you. They tell you of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might, so that all people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all that he does. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all who look to you and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all he does. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. Well, we are in this Summer in the Psalms sermon series. Uh, it's quite a tongue twister. Um, if you can say that 10 times fast, you're not going to get a Starbucks gift card, but you can get a high five from me <clears throat> at the end of the service. Uh, this is an awesome psalm. Psalm 145, it's a psalm of praise. Uh, it's all about David. This is the last psalm that, that is of David. Uh, presumably, this is written near the end of his life. And, and uh, if you know a little bit about David's life, you know that he's had many ups and downs. He has sinned really badly uh, in his life, you know, adultery and murder and cover-up and, and all that. And yet, because of God's grace in his life, he's described as a man after God's own heart. And so he has a lifestyle of appreciation and thankfulness and praise and worship for God, not because he's all put together, but because he's broken and saved by the grace of God. And so this psalm is sort of the culmination of all those threads of his life coming together, and he's just pouring it out uh, for us. You know, there's a, there's a town in Norway called Ryukan, and you'll see some pictures here. Uh, this town is so far north that in the wintertime, uh, the sun barely reaches it. It's actually nestled between two uh, long mountain ranges, and in the winter months, they can see the, on one side, on one mountain range, just a sliver of the sunlight uh, hitting the mountaintop on one side of their town because the other mountain range is blocking it and casting the shadow. And there's an engineer in this town who got this bright idea to uh, put together a system of mirrors and, and ha have a team to, to get up on this mountaintop and build this thing. It's all computer controlled and all that. And it, I mean, it's just an amazing idea, isn't it? So cool to, to, to have this idea of catching the sun uh, that they can see on the mountaintop over here and reflecting it back down into the town. And so there's this, this town square, the center of, of this little village, this town, where people come and they gather and they just enjoy uh, the warmth of this uh, sunlight, even just for a few moments. Uh, one woman described it as both physically and mentally warming. And families go here and, and uh, uh, you know, one local put it this way, the children are beaming. They love it. Uh, one man said that this gives them access to happiness. Uh, it, it's amazing. Now, I, I have a, a little bit of experience living that far north. I was in Iceland for a year in the Air Force, and uh, I remember, I mean, it, it is dark in the wintertime. Sunrise at 1130 in the morning, sunset at 330 in the afternoon, and it just barely comes over the horizon, goes right back down. It's just dusky. Uh, during those hours. And so, you know, we live in the sunshine state, and, you know, we, we can hardly relate to this, but, but this town, they, they find that, wow, if we could just have a little taste of the sunlight, it can really change things. Psalm 145. This is a window 
into David's heart about God. And two things are happening here in this psalm. First, David is serving as a mirror at the top of this mountain peak, and he's shining God's truth and grace down into the dark parts of our own lives. There are dark valleys in our own lives, and he, through this psalm, is shining the truth and the grace of God for us into our lives. And second, David is inviting us to join him up there on the mountaintop so that we can receive God's sunlight like he is and reflect it back down to others. And so there's two points in this message this morning. First, we're going to look at God in this psalm because what reflects out of us depends on what's shining into us. We're going to see what David sees. Second, we're going to see how this psalm calls us to reflect God's glory out into the dark and broken world around us. And so what are we looking at and what is radiating or what's reflecting out of us? So let's begin by looking at God. We first see God's greatness all over this psalm. God's greatness has to do with his, his bigness, his, his power, his authority. The, the relevant questions for us would be like this, you know, is, is God really able to help me? Is he really in charge? Is he able to, to really overcome my discouragements and my depression and my addictions and my struggles? Is he able to overcome these things in my life? Let's look at our passage. We see God's power all over in this psalm. Verse 6 is a great representative uh, verse from among many. He says this, They, that is the generations, tell of the power of your awesome works. God's power, his works are so big and so effective that it takes multiple generations just to tell about them. Now, it's not just raw power, it's royal power. There's a certain majesty to his power. Verse 5, they speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty, and in other verses it speaks of his kingdom, that he, is, he has dominion as a king over it all. He doesn't just have the might, he has the right He not only has the ability to call the entire universe to bow down to him, he has the right to do that. He is king over all kings, and he's orchestrating perfectly in minute detail everything in this universe for his glory and his praise as the king. He has royal power. And not only this, but his kingly rule won't fizzle out or run out of steam. Verse 13 Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. You know, I'm not a I'm not a runner, uh, but my wife convinced me to to run in the uh, uh, what's it called the Pirate Plunder two miler in downtown Melbourne. Now, some of you in this room had did that too, and saw me struggling. Uh, When I say I'm not a runner, I'm not like oh I'm really a runner, and I'm just saying it. No, no, I like. It's like this is, wasn't like a two-mile run. This was like a two-mile shuffle uh, for me. And, you know, my goal at first was to, you know, run as fast as I could. And halfway through, my goal was to survive. I mean, it, 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 just, it just was one of those things for me. Now, aren't you glad that God does not get tired? That he, his, his enduring power and his kingly uh, majesty, it never runs out. Just when we think that, you know, we're bugging him too much or, man, this is such a big problem in my life. I've gone so far away from God. There's no way he can reach me. He has storehouses of power available for us. His kingly power does not run out. Finally, not only is, God's, uh, is God powerful and majestic and enduring, but his greatness is unfathomable. We cannot wrap, wrap our minds around it. Look at verse 3. His greatness no one can fathom. The deepest place on earth is the Marianas Trench just east of the Philippines in the Pacific Ocean. It's seven miles deep. Can you imagine? We have never seen the bottom of the ocean in this place. If you were to take the tallest point on earth, that's Mount Everest, and drop it into this trench, the peak, the top of the mountain, would still be one mile underwater. This is a deep place, and we have never seen it. We have never 
uh, been there. You know, we're constantly, you know, I, I kind of, I'll speak for myself here mostly, you know, I, I constantly am looking for ways to, to figure God out, to, to kind of put him in a box of my own expectations, to kind of control him and, and use him for my purposes. I, I don't think this consciously, but I find that in my heart, I'm really kind of treating God as a sort of a pet God that I, I sort of bring out and enjoy when I want to, uh, or you know, a, a sugar daddy God that, that gives me what I need when I want it. And God is just not like that. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He is not tame. He is not tameable. He is great. He is a great God. We must bow before Him. We must trust Him, even when we don't understand what He's up to. So not only do we see that God is great in the psalm, we also see that He's good. So let's look at His goodness. This theme is also woven all throughout this psalm. You know, God's goodness has to do with the intentions of His heart toward us. We've seen that He's able to help us, but unless He cares about us, that's not really good news. Okay, if you have a God who's able, but just whatever, you know, when He looks at us, that's not good news to us. But we see in the psalm that He's not only powerful, but He wants to help us. He cares for us. We ask questions like, is God really for me? You know, we do go through hard times and, and difficult situations and, and piercing losses in our, in our lives. And we ask that question, is God for me? The resounding answer And the psalm is, yes, he is for us. He is good. Let's look at our passage. We see his, we see a shift actually, you know, up to verse 13 in our passage is talking about the the grandeur, the majesty of this powerful king. And then in verse 14, there's a, a notable shift, almost like a hinge in the middle of this psalm. It says, verse 14, the Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. Did you know that without a telescope, we can only see about 3,000 stars at any given point on Earth in the night sky? But scientists who, over the years, have developed instruments, telescopes, satellites that, that you know, look out into the expanses have estimated, estimated that in our universe that we can see, that we can tell, there are 70 sextillion stars What that is, is that 70 with 21 zeros after it, that is a trillion billion stars. I mean, just just one billion. I I can't kind of grasp the bigness of even just one billion. And then you take that number, you multiply it by a trillion. That's a billion times a thousand. That is a big number. And that's just what our piddly little planet Earth and the instruments that are on it and around it can, can see. That's just what we can see. And in Psalm 147.4, it says that God counts the numbers of the stars and calls them each by name. And Jesus says in Luke 12.7 that the very hairs of your head are all numbered. I mean, think of those stars, the bigness of that. And not only do they have a unique name that's special to God, but every molecule in every one of those stars is completely controlled and administered by God. That's amazing. And he cares about every detail of our lives. If he pays so much attention to these sorts of details that are out there, how much more does he care for us? Look again at verse uh, 15 and 16. This talks about the responsiveness of our great God. It says, the eyes of all look to you and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and you satisfy the desires of every little little thing. You know, the imagery here is just astounding. It's it's picturing that when when animals go out and forage for food and they eat, it's actually God is using natural processes and the laws of nature that he created to hand the food to these animals. He's personally involved in his creation. That's amazing. This, these verses are speaking of God's general goodness to, to all of creation, what theologians uh, call common grace. It's available to those who are believers, those who are not believers. It's out there sometimes. You know, God just is good. I mean, it says he's good in, in a general common sense to all. 
And we see in Matthew 5, 45, Jesus says this, God causes, causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. He is good. It's so easy to see the evil and, and the trauma and the bad stuff in this world, but look at the good also. We can't run away from the bad stuff. We have to look at that square in the eye, but let's account for the good stuff that God is doing through common grace. He is withholding and restraining uh, wickedness, as, and it could go much worse, but God is restraining it in his grace and his goodness. But if God responds that readily to the needs of plants and animals and, and creation in general, how much more responsive is he to us? And we see this responsiveness again in verse 18 and 19. It says, the Lord is near to all who call on him. He fulfills the desires of all who fear him. He hears their cry and he saves them. Jesus says this in Matthew 6, look at the birds of the air, they do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Now, admittedly, we often have a hard time sensing and feeling the responsiveness of God. There are times that in life where we have been crying out certain prayers, remove this ailment from my body, save my child, my parent, my friend, my neighbor, Lord, I lost my job. Lord, why is it taking so long? We have these sorts of, of prayers and cries to God, and, and oftentimes, and I've seen this in my own life, I think I know what I need, and usually my definition of need is not discomfort, but comfort. It's not, you know, loss of control, um, but I want control, really, uh, in my life. There are, there are times when we pray like this that, you know, we, we do cry out, and God always answers, sometimes with a yes, sometimes with a no, sometimes with a wait, but He always is responsive to our cries and to our needs. He knows best what we really need. I found that my deepest need is to be reconciled to God and to grow in an intimate, walking relationship with Him. And sometimes, and usually, actually, God uses hard stuff in my life to refine me, to, to chip away the stuff that's not me in Christ. So God um, doesn't just, uh, you know, turn a blind eye or ignore us. He's not doing that to us. He is intimately involved in orchestrating even the hard stuff of life for our good and for His glory. I found that the second half of verse 13, look at this with me, the second half is true. The Lord is trustworthy in all His promises and faithful in all He does. He is so good. He is so good. Johnny Erickson Tata was in a diving accident when she was 17 years old. Uh, to date, she's been a quadriplegic in a wheelchair for just over 50 years, and so just this past year, she has been celebrating, actually, her the, the 50 years that she's been in this wheelchair since the accident. Uh, she is paralyzed from her neck down. She has no use of her arms and legs. Uh, she gets things done with tools in her mouth and gets around that way on a motorized chair. And she says this, only God is capable of telling us what our rights and needs are. You have to surrender that right to him. And then she says in the same blog reflections of her 50 years, she says, the weaker I am, the harder I must lean on God's grace. The harder I lean on him, the stronger I discover him to be and the bolder my testimony to his grace. That's so powerful. God meets our deepest needs even when we don't feel it. The last passage we'll look, like, look at on God's goodness is verse eight. This is kind of, a, kind of a capstone here of his goodness. It says that the Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. It's not just that he acts these ways, it's that he is these, these things. He doesn't just act graciously and lovingly, he is these things. And so when we're having a hard time and we don't feel his presence, let's appeal to his character, uh, not just that he sometimes does these things, let's appeal to who he is. So wherever you are, whatever you're struggling with, know that God is breathtaking in his greatness. He's overflowing in his goodness. Verse 3 says that he is most worthy of praise. He is worthy of praise. And so this brings us to our response, which is worship. I just want to give a kind of a working definition of worship. What is it? What is worship? 
It's simply acknowledging God's worthship or his worthiness. God shines down his glory on us through his greatness and his goodness, and we respond by making much of him, by exalting him, by pointing to him. It's us saying, yes, I see this God, and I'm experiencing the greatness and goodness of this God, and, and I want the privilege of just magnifying him and reflecting that back to him. So let's see what this worship looks like. In our passage, there are four characteristics that we'll run through really quickly in Psalm 145. First, true worship is attentive to God. Verse 15 puts it this way, that the eyes of all look to you. There's a kind of looking, there's a looking up from our circumstances to looking to God. And how do we do this in a sustained way, a daily way? Verse 5, I will meditate on your wonderful works. Verse 18, the Lord is near to all who call on him. This is the word and prayer. This is the word and prayer. So we meditate on his works by going to his self-disclosure, his revelation of himself. That's the Bible. We learn about his works. We think about his works. We, we see what he did for us through Jesus Christ. He's the creator, sustainer, redeemer of our lives. That's the whole story of the Bible. All of these powerful works for us on our behalf that he's done. And so we meditate on these things in prayer uh, as well. How regular, verse 2, look how regular David is doing this. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. You know, worship is not just what we're doing right now uh, in church. It's not just a weekend thing. It actually is a lifestyle. Second, we see that true worship is dependent on God. Verse 15, the eyes of all look to you and you give them their food at the proper time. You know, worshiping God is is, is not just a pretty good idea. It's, it's so much more than that. It's, it's recognizing that we can't even have a worthy or meaningful life apart from recognizing that he is sustaining us moment by moment. And third, true worship is sincere. We see this in verse 18. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. In truth. In other words, we can't worship what we don't know. We worship God as he is, not as we want him to be. We worship God knowing ourselves in light of him. We have evaluations of ourselves or a view of ourselves that's not always right. We think sometimes that we're better than we really are or, you know, we don't believe his forgiveness and his redemption and we're, you know, we're condemning ourselves and things when God isn't condemning us. It is all kinds of problems we have where we're lying to ourselves about who God is and who we are. And so we worship him in truth, you know. The more we get to know who this God is, the, we, begin, we begin to realize that God is the safest place on earth to be real, to take the masks off, to take the pretenses, drop them down, and just stand before him and not hide and be real before him. And finally, true worship is satisfying. Worshiping a God that's this great and this good never feels, it shouldn't feel, like a chore or a burden. Verse 7 joyfully sing of your righteousness. Verse 16, you satisfy the desires of every living thing. Verse 19, he fulfills the desires of those who fear him. And just a couple of verses later, Psalm 147, the very first verse says this, praise the Lord, how good it is to sing praises to our God, how pleasant and fitting to praise him. I love that imagery of, of how fitting it is to praise him. It's like there's puzzle pieces in our hearts. And when we begin to live for God and, and live a lifestyle of worship for God who is at the center of our lives, it clicks. We begin to realize this is what I've been longing for all my life. This is what it means to live, to be human, to be in this world is to worship God. John Piper describes this journey in his own life of finding worship as satisfaction he says this in his book, Desiring God, praising God, the highest calling of humanity in our eternal vocation did not involve the renunciation, but rather the consummation of the joy I so desired. God is not worshiped where he is not treasured and enjoyed. Not to enjoy God is to dishonor him. To say to him that something else satisfies you more is the opposite of worship. So, as we take in God, we reflect him out through our lives. And so, let's look at this reflection, reflecting God. 
But before we can see the practical outworkings of this reflection, we have to see that we are broken mirrors. We were meant to be mirroring and reflecting God in all of his grandeur, but we're broken. We were created back in Genesis in God's image to reflect his leadership over creation, reflect his dignity, reflect his glory, and we blew it. <laughs> Sin entered in to the picture. Ephesians 4, 18 describes our life after the fall. We were darkened in our understanding and separated from the life of God. It's like being in that valley where the sun can't reach. We've been separated from God, and we have been shattered as his reflectors of his glory. Now, what's so, so tragic about this is, is, is that sin is not just doing bad things or failing to do good things. It is those things, but it's also and more fundamentally about self-lordship. It's about kicking God off the throne of our lives and putting ourselves on the throne of our lives. We, we don't like to be mirrors of God. We like to be black holes that, that suck up all the, the attention and the praise and the control and the power and the comfort and the things that we can possibly get out of this life for ourselves. And you know about black holes, right? Not even light can escape a black hole. And, and that's what's so tragic about this. And we see this, this tragedy being expressed at the end, near the end of our psalm in verse 20. And this, this seems at first like a, like a harsh uh, word in the midst of such a positive psalm, but look at this. The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. It is a wicked thing for us to, to reach out for the, the fruit that God has forbidden, and it's not just because God said so and we disobey him. It's because we look at that fruit and say, well, it looks good to me. We set ourselves up as the judge and jury of what's good for us, and we fail to obey and listen to God and what he says is good for us. It's self-lordship. That's what sin is. It's such a tragedy. David is saying here that there are basically two kinds of people. There's the wicked and there are the saved. It's a hard truth to hear, but we have to feel the weight of how far we've fallen and how shattered these mirrors are. That's the bad news. Now, look at the good news in this psalm. How do people move from being shattered mirrors to being fully restored, repaired mirrors? Look at verses 18 and 20. Again, the Lord is near to all who call on Him, to all who call on Him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear Him. He hears their cry and He saves them. And the Lord watches over all who love him. We can clearly see this shift from being wicked to being saved. He doesn't say in this passage he, that God is near to all who earn his favor. He's not saying that. He's not saying that he fulfills the desires of all those who impress him with their good works. He's not saying that he sees our obedience and our good intentions and then saves us because of that. Not at all. Rather, it says in, the, in these verses, he saves those who fear him, who acknowledge his lordship. What that means is, is, is putting God back in his rightful place as Lord in our hearts. Now, we actually don't make him Lord. He already is Lord. It's just simply acknowledging in the core of our being that he's at the center and he has the right to lead us, to, to uh, command us, to tell us how to live. And we find as we come into this submissive relationship with him that it's actually the most joy-filled kind of life we could ever live. But the way that we are saved is to call out and to cry out to him, saying, I can't do life on my own. I've reached a place in my life where I realize I can't do this on my own. I need God. I need his provisions. It says that all those who love him, those who, who want him, who desire him, who want to, who recognize that they're separated and then they're in darkness and say, you know what? I am so tired of living apart from God, I just want to come back to him. That is the person who God is close to, who's near to, whom he upholds and whom he lifts up. That's what it means to be saved. So we've seen that the way to get saved in this psalm is that we recognize that we can't save ourselves. We must put our full trust in God's provision. Now, I want to get a little more specific because this has got to plug into the grand storyline of the whole Bible. 
we're going to see in our next point that Jesus is the ultimate mirror. He's the ultimate mirror. And as we come to faith in Christ, we are, we are put spiritually in Christ. We are in him and he is in us. And because he is the ultimate mirror, we then are enabled through Christ to receive God's goodness and greatness, to reflect it back to God in worship, and to reflect it out everywhere around us uh, in various practical ways. But he is our ultimate mirror. I want to point out three biblical pictures of Jesus um, that are really cool. I love these, these images. The Bible says in Colossians 1 that the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. The second image is that he's the last Adam. In 1 Corinthians 15, it says, the first man, Adam, became a living being, the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. And the third image is that Jesus is our ultimate worship leader. In Hebrews chapter 12, it says this, Jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. In the assembly, I will sing your praises. So what's going on here? Where we were made in God's image and were broken and shattered because of sin, Jesus succeeds. He wins. He is the perfect image of God, perfectly reflecting God. He's the perfect human being. We had the first Adam who fell. We fell in Adam and Eve. And Jesus is the last Adam. He's the human that comes down. He's God in the flesh who comes down, and he perfectly fulfills what humanity is supposed to look like and be like. He's the perfect human, and he's our worship leader. Where we have failed to worship God with our lives, he is leading the charge of restoring us back to worship. And I love the imagery in this Hebrews 12. It's actually talking, he's, he's quoting from the, uh, from the Old Testament Psalms, and he's describing himself, Jesus, is our ultimate worship leader. Paxson and the praise team up here on stage, they're not the ultimate worship leaders. Uh, I'm not leading you in worship ultimately in preaching God's word. Jesus is among us through the ministry of the Holy Spirit collectively in this place, and he's leading our praises collectively. He also leads us individually as we go about our work and, and home life and being good neighbors and doing all that we do as Christians. He leads us in worship to bow before him. So as we're in Christ, we learn through this relationship with him what it means to worship God with our lives. You know, Jesus doesn't just save us from something. He does save us from sin. He he died on the cross to pay for our sins. He lived a perfect, obedient life when he was on earth to achieve the righteousness that we need, that we can't generate on our own. Uh, but he doesn't just give us a ticket to heaven with all that. He doesn't just save us from slavery to sin. He does. But it's so much more than that. He saves us for something. He saves us for worship. He saves us for reflecting God and his greatness and goodness. And so shining out for God, this is our last point today. When we are enthralled by God's grace in Christ, we want, we want other people to join in with us in praising this God. There's just something that's compelling. When we enjoy this God, we want others to come in with us. Uh, I was at the zoo with my two oldest boys, Josiah and Trenton, uh, just a few days ago, and it was just so fun. We hadn't been to the zoo in uh, probably over a year, and they're at the age now where they're, they're beginning to appreciate just different things, cool things. Look at what that animal's doing. Check this out. Hey, come here. Look at this. And so we were doing that with each other. Hey, hey look at this. You know, there's a kangaroo like right in the path uh, there at the zoo just, just laying on its side, just chilling. You know, I just was imagining um, dark sunglasses on this, this kangaroo, you know, this is a cool kangaroo, and, but we're, we're kind of calling each other over, look at this, look how funny this is, um, you know, we were in the butterfly garden thing, that, you know, enclosed area, and uh, just, I remember seeing a butterfly that was, had bigger wings and more vibrant colors than I had ever seen before, and I was like, guys, come here, look at this, and I pointed at it and said, isn't God creative? And we were just sat there for a few seconds, just enjoying God's creativity uh, in creating these animals. When we are enthralled by something, when something catches us and captivates us, we can't help 
but want to, to pull others into it. There's, there's something flat or incomplete about responding to God in worship when it's just us individually. That's why it's so important to come to church on the weekends. It's not about, you know, earning God's favor or anything like that. It's about, man, I want to be regular in hearing the praises, not just for me, but f- from the people of God in, in, uh, in church. Uh, it, when we get taste of His goodness, we want to invite others into it. Um, <clears throat> we see this in verse, verses 4 through 6. Take a look at this. He says, One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will, pro- will proclaim your great deeds. Do you notice there in those, look, look at those verses again. It, it goes from they to I. They, they are doing this, I am doing that. They are doing this, I am doing that. He goes back and forth with they and I. What is he doing here? This is what's called antiphonal singing. In other words, uh, it's kind of like when sometimes in church service we'll have responsive readings or responsive prayers, or even just when we're singing songs together, we're hearing each other sing as we are singing. There's something bigger that is expressed when we are lifting up together, back and forth, the praises of God together. Uh, it's it's kind of like... Um, a stereo system. You know, God is, is inhabiting the praises of his people, and he's hearing his praises in stereo from us. It's awesome to, to think of worship as this horizontal thing. He's so great and he's so good, we should want as many images of God to come in and join in this uh, stereophonic, this surround sound system of praising God. You know, when I go into to Best Buy, you know that dark room in the back? It's kind of mysterious, you know, and, and, and you go in here and all the lights are dim and there's these big TVs and these home theater systems and whatnot, and there's like this couch in the middle and you're supposed to go in and, and sit down and put on earphones or, or sit in there and listen to the, the system that's in there. I'm afraid of those places. I mean, I think they're going to plug into my brain somehow and make me buy this stuff. It, it's just weird. But that is the idea that, that God inhabits the praises of his people. And when we sing out, when we invite others in to this, these praises of God, uh, we are bringing him much glory. David not only reaches out to other people, but he also reaches out to all of creation. Look at verse 10. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. Verse 21, the last uh, verse in the psalm, my mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature, every creature, praise his holy name forever and ever. In Luke chapter 19, Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. There are people who are shouting his praises, some with sincere hearts, some without sincere hearts, but they're shouting his praises. The Pharisees are getting irritated about this. They they tell Jesus to rebuke these people that are, that are calling him Hosanna and all these things. And Jesus looks at the Pharisees and he says this, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. The stones will cry out. Brothers and sisters, we cannot let the stones do our job for us. We were meant to praise God, to worship him with our entire lives. And it takes generations of people to fill out that praise. It takes multiple people singing in unison and in unity to fill out the praises of God. It takes creation just to approximate, just to get a taste of how great this God is. But think about how many things, you know, all the different things in our lives that were called by God in the Bible to do and to be. We're called to mature in our faith, to grow in holiness, to say no to sin and, and yes to righteousness, to put off the old man, put on the new. We're called to, to repent of our sins and, and lean in, into him by faith. We're called to represent God in our work and our labors. We bear witness uh, to unbelievers about Jesus. We're to give a cup of cold water to thirsty people. We're to come alongside hurting people and help them. 
we raise our kids in the instruction and the nurture of the Lord. We're to disciple younger unbelievers to help them grow in their faith and mature. Uh, we get involved in the missional lifestyle to, to, uh, to either be goers or senders of, of the gospel advancing worldwide. We're to be a part of all these things as Christians. And so my question is, how does worship fit into that? All those things. Is worship just another bullet on that list of things we're to do? And I propose to you that the answer is no, because worship undergirds and fulfills all of those all of those things we're called to do. John Piper uh, put it this way. Look at this. This is from his book, Let the Nations Be Glad. He's speaking of global missions. He says, missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. Missions exist because worship doesn't. Worship is ultimate, not missions, because God is ultimate, not man. When this age is over and the countless millions of the redeemed fall on their faces before the throne of God, missions will be no more. It is a temporary necessity, but worship abides forever. Do you see the connection? All of life is about worship. So let me just walk through some of these, the things that we're to do. Think about evangelism. You know, when we go there, we talk about evangelism, we feel guilty, we feel afraid, we look at our failures, all the times that we had opportunities and we didn't take them. It's so discouraging to think about just the simple thing of sharing our faith with unbelievers. I beat myself up about this stuff. You're not alone in that. I fail often in these things. But think about what evangelism really is. Evangelism is about being so taken up into the goodness and the greatness of God that we want our unbelieving fellow person, fellow image of God that is broken, shattered, tarnished to be repaired and restored by this great God who brings saving grace into their lives so that that person, that unbeliever is now living for his praises. It's another system of mirrors. It's another set of mirrors that is reflecting back God's praises, and that should please our souls because, ah, now there's a, a, another person along with me who's now giving God praise because he so deserves it. So evangelism is not just about, it's not just about, you know, doing what we should, although it is. It's not just about giving this person the deepest satisfaction they've always known, they just don't realize it yet. It is that, but it's about bringing even more praise, even more worship to this great God. Discipleship is helping young believers grow in their ability to reflect back God. Parenting, it's a special kind of discipleship. Or raising our kids, the next generation, to sing his praises with their lives. Marriage is a man and a woman covenanting together to make much of God. Encouragement, the simple idea of encouragement. We're commanded by God to encourage one another as long as it is called today. What is that about? It's about calling forth or recognizing something of God in that other person and verbally acknowledging it. I see God in you. When you did that, when you said that, when you helped this person, I saw God at work in you. That's encouragement, is calling forth praises to God. When we go to work, this is the task of subduing and organizing and beautifying God's creation to show God off, <laughs> to praise Him. Small groups, that's when we join up with fellow believers in little communities of faith to, to support and spur one another on toward love and good deeds so that we'd be better mirrors reflecting God's praises. Missions is having a part in calling forth antiphonal praises around the globe so that God will be glorified from the nations. It should break our hearts, brothers and sisters, that there are places in this world that do not have access to a Bible in their own language. It should break our hearts that there are unbelievers next door to us who don't realize who this God is and what he has done. They don't realize it. It should break our hearts and move us to draw them into the greatness and the goodness of God. So as David saw God and reflected him down, and as we come up to the mountainside and join him and see God with him, we reflect out his praises, his glory, his greatness, and his goodness to all who are around us. So three questions as we end. How about your life? Are you looking at God? Are you savoring 
God? Are you savoring his greatness and his goodness? Are you reflecting him out to those around you? Do you see Jesus as your true and ultimate mirror who, who manifests God's glory in this world? Are you abiding in him? Are you satisfied in him? Are you an ambassador for him? Are you shining out for him? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we confess that uh, we so often get in the way of ourselves. We so often um, eclipse the bright shining of your glory with our sin, with our self-lordship, with our um, kind of taking matters into our own hands, with our, our, our hiding in our shame and not coming to you. There's so many places in our lives, Lord, that need more of the bright glory of your grace. And we want to receive it, Lord. We receive it now. We thank you that you are so ready to pour out your grace for us. Father, there are, there's some among us who are really hurting, who are suffering, who feel far away from you, who don't sense your presence. Father, help them not to minimize that or sweep it under the rug, but to, to face it, to name it, and to bring it to you, to lay it all at your feet. Lord, show that you are strong in their lives, that you are there, that you're present. Meet their deepest needs in the midst of their pain. Be living water in the midst of dry uh, desert places in their lives. Father, we want to live for you. We want uh, your praises to ring out from our church, from our lives, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces. And Father, we know we can't do that in our own strength. We need your, your power. We need your spirit to help us, to embody us, to to mobilize us to love people well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.